look. There we go. So I'm so excited to talk to you. Would you like to start off by just saying your name and where you are? Yeah, my name is Debbie Plummer and I'm currently in Cleveland, Ohio, um, but also, you know, have been embedded in Boston, Massachusetts. So um, do still do work both places and consider Boston a second home. Okay. So the first big question here is, uh, who are you? Who are you as a human being? And I mean, that could be your values, your interests, your passions, or whatever you'd like to share about yourself. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. And I love that question. You know, I have two t-shirts now that I, I love to wear. One that says, be a better human. And the other one says, be a nice human. So mm -hmm. when you ask me about, you know, um, who I am as a human, and I love, you know, the humans of Gasalt, I think that that is a focal point for where we need to be as, um, as a country, as a nation, as a people, you know, when I say country and nation, I'm referring, you know, primarily to the U.S., but I know it has implications around the globe. But um, so who I am as a, as, a, as a human, I am a person who actually believes deeply in the goodness of humanity and people's capacity. Um, and I think about folks in their layers. You know, I always use the analogy of an onion mm -hmm. and at the core of that onion are those, it's really the stem, but it keeps unraveling, but it makes all those layers. And so I think when we are at our best at our, in our, in being human, we're at the core of who we are in that goodness. And so when core can speak the core and not out of our layers, then I think we have more meaningful contact. And so that's what I was about as a therapist. And that's what I'm about right now as a, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging specialists trying to get core to speak to core <laughs> and how to have people act out of their core and not out of those layers. And so that's really what I do. I'm a psychologist by profession, mm -hmm. but have worked in the space for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging now for, gosh, you know, since 2006, you know, in terms of deeply and gave up my um, clinical practice then, but most, and now do work on a systems level. Mm -hmm. And I'm a wife, uh, uh, a go-to aunt for a lot of my family. I'm the local bank <laughs> in some ways. Um, for my family, for some of my family, I am a, a, a loving God, the two God sons, love one, and God children, you know, that the who are in my family. I like dogs better than I like people. But you still have some faith in people. We, we might yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I still like people. I like people a lot, but I just happen to like dogs better. <laughs> That's fair. So what about yourself and your own structure? Would you say that there's a particular value that you organize yourself around? Um, hmm, a particular value. I, um, I am wrapped as a black woman. Um, and have been unraveling what that means and that my identity, you know, that was given, that's the visual that was given to me. And, um, you know, but my parents, my mom was from Panama um, and first language was Spanish and my dad was from Jamaica. And so, and we grew up, um, our family grew up in, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio in the um, inner city which was known as 
a, the ghetto, but I didn't know it was a ghetto. I only just knew it as my neighborhood. And so a, all of that really, um, really influenced how I saw myself and the values that I hold. So the values, you know, come from being, you know, being a woman, being a black woman, but multiracial, multicultural in my identity and perspective. And so I hold that value for how people bring themselves and, you know, with who they are, I see that as not something that's just ordained by society. So I'm more interested in how it unravels for folks. I value I value our collective experience as humans and collective identity and goodness of people. Yeah. You know, despite they do some really crazy, stupid things right now. But I think and believe. we always have. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Hmm. So I, I'm curious about, I mean, diversity in, in equity and in, I'm, I'm interested in the last two, inclusion and belonging. What do those mean for you as a person? Mm -hmm. You know, and I more recently added the belonging piece. I was going to say, I haven't heard that one. Honestly, I haven't heard it from anyone except you just now. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not well versed in diversity training. It's not a big thing here in Mexico, but okay. I'm learning. Yeah. So. And it's, it's getting catching on more, I think, in the US because when I think about, okay, you know, diversity, of course, is the, the mix, if you will. <laughs> it's the representation, the composition that's there. The equity piece has to do with how people get their, um, how they get equal treatment, you know, so they, how they have this, um, the same, the treatment may be different, let me put it that way, equal treatment, but that means that it's not always the same treatment, that the treatment could be different, but it has to be equal in terms of its rights and its responsibilities and access and success measures and things like that. So inclusion, you know, is about creating conditions by which we can leverage all of our differences mm -hmm. and in organizations and how we can achieve a business objective or a mission. And so, so some people have really talked about inclusion as a feeling, you know, like, like um, and I've always purported that inclusion is more than a feeling because the feeling is on the individual level of system. And we know that there are certainly um, systems where people who represent the group who is experiencing the ism, you know, don't exactly experience it or don't care or, yeah. you know, they say, I'm okay. And then there are people who experience it and it may not be attributed to the ism, <laughs> you know, something personally. So it's more than a feeling and it's, it's about condition now, but that feeling state is important. And I think that's why we added belonging because when people don't feel as if they are a part or that their opinions are valued or that they are um, valued for their individual attributes, then they don't feel like they belong. Yeah. And then what happens is that the group who does feel like they belong, then they start to to codify all the characteristics by which they are the same and then you start othering people, <laughs> you know, so we got a lot of othering going on, you know, yeah. and that's what happens today. You know, we have, um, even when we talk about like whites and BIPOC, black indigenous people of color or black Asian minority ethnics in the UK. And so this black, you know, we're still othering, you know, we're mm -hmm. making another, we have a norm that we've set up and then we've made the other. And so belonging is about trying to make that we're all human, you know? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm imagining like a desegregated school is doing the inclusion, like the check the box, but there is no felt sense of actually belonging. Right. It's like the thing was done, but the feeling of belonging 
is not exactly. sustained. Exactly because you still have the same ownership, you still yep. have the same policies, practices, and procedures that support those who are the dominant group. And yep. so when you have belonging, it is based on human tendencies, human every, you know, it's not about the wrapping or the politics or they think it's about we belong because we're all have that shared identity as human beings. Yeah, that word really caught my attention just when you presented yourself. So thank you for that little detour. I want to ask you about yourself, though, a little bit more about your own history. And if you can think of a particular event or a set of circumstances um, that you would say really shaped who you are or continues to influence you in a significant way today. Um, that's a great question. I think it would probably vary at different times in my life. You know, so the first part of it, you wanted to know about how, where, how to. An where, event or a set of circumstances. And I mean, this is like a very gestalt question, just like whatever pops yeah. up for you. So I think, um, you know, when I mentioned my mom was from Panama and my dad was from Jamaica, um, you know, the event around that has happens to be that, you know, when I went to, from my early school days, you know, going to school, even as a black person or an African-American, and we were moving then from Negro to black, you know, um, I was aware that I was different even than other blacks because of my parents' background, you know, like, um, and now that I have a better sense of U.S. history and the great migration to from the South to the North that's chronicled in Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of the Other Suns, you know, um, I, I have a better understanding of why then I felt so different because my parents weren't like the other, you know, black families on the street where they all had strong Southern roots. You know, they were going back to the South for family reunions. They were going, you know, um, they had um, their foods that they cooked, like, you know, the greens and, you know, um, you know, and, and black eyed peas and um, chitlins and, you know, um, you know, lots of different Southern dishes that we weren't familiar with. And our family was eating, you know, roast compollo and, um, you know, um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, south, south and other stuff and, you know, making fruit cakes at the holiday time and, you know, and my mom, you know, speaking Spanish to my uncles when they didn't want us to understand what they were talking about, you know, and we were Catholic and not, where it's Catholic and not Baptist, you know, so there was a lot of influence on that that really shaped, you know, who I am today and what that was about. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering about other people that you've met in your life. If, if there's a particular person, I'm sure there's a lot, but if there's a person who comes to mind right now as a, a significant influence, were a really important person in your life. Oh, okay. Really important person in my life. Um, gosh, there are many. I think, you know, in the Gestalt space, particularly, and that's what came to mind, I think, with here, because when I saw folks like um, Jackie McLemore comes to mind and, um, Marianne Krauss, and some of the people that, that I experienced early on in um, after I graduated, um, you know, from graduate school and was continuing the work, I saw them in action either facilitating or doing work and just liked how they use themselves. And so I said, I want to do that. I want to be like that. You know, and it really wasn't about one thing they like a body of work or anything. It's just how they use themselves. Mm -hmm. And 
I thought it was important for me to look at how I used myself. You know, now I'm thinking about this. This is like a theme of being human. You know, how they were as human beings, and there, there are certainly others. I'm, I'm blocking on some of the names that they're from a long time ago. You know, mm -hmm. um, but about that using yourself. Can you unpack that a little bit more? I mean, how did you learn to use yourself or what were you, how, how did that change for you? Well, first it wasn't style. It was like using the language, you right. know, like, um, you know, there's a lot of jargon with that. So I would try to, you know, I'd mimic those language. And then of course my, my sisters and other people would mock me out like, you know, <laughs> like, because they would say, hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, what if I would say, you know, let's contract for this rather than just say, can we agree, you know, or something like that. Then, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? You know, so at first it was like using myself by trying to put the language, but then it was more about how to hold space mm -hmm. for others, how to be more mindful of what was going on inside of me you know, so, the, and how I was responding, like right before this call, I was on with um, a client that I have to do some facilitation for later this week. And it was a prep call, but I felt like it was very controlling on their end of what they wanted me to do. You know, mm -hmm. like rather than me just say, the saying, come, come in, you know, Dr. Palmer, wants you just to facilitate. They were saying, you know, um, well, we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And then we told the first, um, panelists, you know, that the, we gave them each five minutes to talk about this. And I said, well, what do you need me for? You know, and I think I was, you know, all through that time, I was aware of how I was feeling and reacting. And then, you know, and then some of my past stuff kicked in about, okay, this is what they want me to do. This is what they're paying me to do. But then I said, said, I don't think you need me, you know, <laughs> you know, the way you've designed this, I'm wondering if I need, even need to be engaged in this, you know, it sounds like you've got an agenda there that's really ambitious. And if I step out of it, even to get this and I don't, I'm not sure if I'm aligned with that goal or my brand is aligned with how mm -hmm. I want to use myself in this space, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, that's an example of when I say use how I use myself, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just swallowing it all and getting angry and then saying, oh, you know, never again, I should have charged them more. I should have, <laughs> 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 you know, which is why I say, this isn't worth it. I can't wait till this is over, you know, to be able to just, um, you know, just to go with the what is. And the people that I named before, I saw them as doing that. And mm -hmm. so, I thought yeah, that that whole idea of authentic presence sort of comes to mind. Exactly. That's just a good showing one. up as you really are kind of thing. Yep. Yep. And you know what? They're not, they're not going to, you know, I always think, you know, people are going to hate you or they're going to do this. And no, they don't, you know, and it, it just actually works out better for you and for them, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another question is about your experience of yourself within your gender and i know that's probably phrased oddly but i was trying to steer people away from kind of giving classes about mm -hmm. because i'm curious about your own experience of yourself as a woman or within your gender mm -hmm. you know and that that is one that i that i wish with the intersection of age that i had had more awareness of a long time ago you know yeah. um and only because I would love to see how that, how it would have evolved, you know, with mm -hmm. more, because I'm old enough to, you know, come in what they said, this is where it was dictated to you what woman, being a woman was about, and then how it would unravel. And I did have some confusion around that because, you know, I was always in a world, I, I was in a, 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 a space of women with uh, women, for a long time with both in going to an all girls Catholic girls, you know, a Catholic girls school. So that was all women. Then I went to an, a women's college, you know, and then I lived for 13 years in um, a religious order, 
you know, of all women. So I had a lot of experience with women, but the good part about that was that I learned how to, you know, the leadership piece or being intimidated by men, you know, didn't phase me because I, you know, I'd learned, you know, to speak up and hold my own and because my worlds were all women. So it didn't make, you know, so mm -hmm. it was different. But where I would have, where I say like now in that awareness of the, the array of what that meant in terms of gender and gender expression in women, you know, and um, who you can love and not love, you know, and how, you, how you're supposed to be. And, you know, um, particularly as a black woman, you know, I, I, I probably would have had a more experimental stance with that, even though I, I sort of did, you know, because I love myself, but I, I try to find, you know, I, I don't find that that, that has landed yet. <laughs> that makes any sense that I still float in this, this identity in terms of, of women, you know, or what, or what it means in terms of woman. And I'm not even talking, you know, um, you know, part of it is, is sexual and attraction and chemistry and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, it is just about what, you know, what space that I hold around that, you know, in, in terms of, particularly in relationship to to men. And now that we have more fluidity in that kind of continuum, I find that exciting, you know? Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Not that, not, that, not that at 68, I'm gonna do anything differently, but it's just, I find you it never intellectually. Know. Yeah, you never, you don't, never know, you know? <laughs> it's, you know? it's still 2020, anything yeah. is possible. <laughs> You've got a month left, you know? I find that is a very exciting freeing. It, it doesn't, it's not scary. It's just, I think that that is, I think that is very exciting to have not have those limitations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, based on any part of our expression of who we are. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your age. I'm also not wondering how you're experiencing that. You don't have to say what it is if you don't want to, but I'm just curious how you're experiencing that. Well, I, feel the best that I've ever felt in my life in terms of, um, and I'm, I'm going like this because I'm thinking alignment in, in terms of like my core identity, um, centered, all of those things. Um, so that feels exciting. Um, like the ability to be able to say to the people, like, I don't think you need me or, you know, um, or even in my faith tradition to call myself a anti-cleric, conscientious objector, Catholic and tell the bishop off and, you know, and do those things because, you know, I, I don't feel like, oh, who are you? You know, you're just a, you're just a white old man, you know, you're, you're not little, you know, I, I, I feel there's a certain freedom in that, you know, um, and particularly now that I am not working internal to an organization, you know, <laughs> one, and one of the reasons why I wanted to retire, you know, was I, it just, it dawned on me. I don't want to ever go through another evaluation, annual review. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to do it, you know? And especially because it occurred to me that I had been working as a chief diversity officer, internal to systems, reporting to white men who knew nothing about diversity, you know, in the same way, and yet they were evaluating me. It just wow. seemed upside down. And so now, you know, that I have the freedom to say, you know, to look at organizations and have that relationship and say, um, you know, this will work, this is going to be a win-win, mm -hmm. you know, when it's not a win-win, you know, not to, not to engage that that's a certain free. So that, that comes with the age part. And I love that. And at the other hand, I'm also aware that it is, I call myself young old, you know, that as I move to this latter part, there isn't, you know, my mother was 92 when she passed my father, my father was 76. So I always take like the average around mm -hmm. that, that I've got. And so I think, okay, I've got somewhere between 
you know, 10 and 20, you know, 12, 20 years. And so that's not a lot of time. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of stuff I want to do, you know, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're pretty intense. I have a feeling I don't want to waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, you know, this is the healthiest and youngest I'm ever going to be right now. So <laughs> I got to do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I do have another question a little bit more about you personally before we get into sort of the gestalt part of it. And I've been asking this mostly to older white men lately, but I would also like to ask you what your relationship or your experience of privilege and power are where you are in your life right now. My experience of privilege and power? Or your relationship to them. And my relationship to them? Mm -hmm. It's more, I'm gonna say it's a contemplative approach and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because, you know, um, in the United States with this past election, you know, um, it revealed to me as to many um, where we are around race, power, and privilege, um, and how uneven our experiences are, how siloed our experiences are, and how white still hold power and privilege, social privilege in ways that they don't understand and that do incredible harm to blacks, indigenous and people of color. Um, and, and more importantly, they don't seem to care, you know, and so when I say contemplative approach, I have to go back within my sense and my core to hold that in a way that I'm not going to go out <laughs> and tear people's. <laughs> I was going to just be so angry and just use that energy or be yeah. done with white people as many of my friends are, you know, uh, friends who are, are black. Or, uh, or brown, you know, who just say I'm done, you know, because I am, I am more concerned about that result of being done or continue to live siloed or continue to live in this very, very divided society than I am with, so with doing nothing or being done. So I want to be able to find a way to turn us and them into we, to continue to do that, to be able to still hold myself and, and to express the anger in ways that are productive, but yet not being committed to white people's comfort, you know, which I have for a long, long time. And so contemplative, uh, contemplative stances, I'm still, I'm going like this, I'm going inward so I can figure this out. Mm -hmm. And then I'll come back out, you know, I'll come back fighting, but fighting it effectively and productively. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I, I am going to switch up a little bit now, which is to ask about another relationship in your life, which is your relationship to Gestalt and how you found it and how that came about for you. Relationship to me? Mm -hmm. You and Gestalt, how did you guys meet? Oh, know? me and Gestalt, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, how did we meet? Gestalt, I met for the very first time in, a, in, a, in my graduate program at Kent State University in a class that mm -hmm. Ansel Walt taught. I don't know if it was the full class where he came in just to teach about Gestalt. And I, at the time, was looking for an approach to the work or my own kind of like school of thought that would resonate with how I use myself as a therapist, you know, and also with multicultural applications of clinical psychology. That was, I was particularly interested in that. And so, because the, the stuff around black psychology 
felt too limited, but yet I didn't want to just take and apply all of these other theories on something. So I wanted to kind of find which ones had the best applications so that I could use it in a way that bridged those two. And so it seemed like a stop. You know, was able to do that. I love the language around it. I love the holistic kind of concepts, yeah. and um, you know, all of the other principles made sense to me. And then Andy said in the class, you know, that we should all take advantage of going to the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland, if because especially because we we're in Cleveland, it was so close. And if we were going to continue to, you know, if we were there to take advantage of it, so. <laughs> I always say I'm, you know, the, the good Catholic girl. I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. You know, you write it down. And and I truly I wrote it down <laughs> and remember that. Oh. <laughs> like, okay, after you go finish to Gestalt your, Institute your, of go, Cleveland. Yeah, go go to the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. <laughs> That's literally what I did in terms of the next step for professional development. And so I did, I took a workshop and oh gosh, Brenda, I can't remember her last name. And it, I took one workshop and she was fabulous. And then I became a workshop junkie. Um, just kept taking workshops and showing up, you know. In the meantime, I had also gone to NTL Institute for um, to get a diversity management certificate. And although I found it good for content, it wasn't good for process. So I was just really excited by taking the content here and then here's the process work. And then I did the, I'm looking at my degrees, uh, my certificate things up here, that three-year postgraduate training program, Gestalt Methods, working with groups. Gosh, that is, is so faded, it's like 1995, <laughs> I did that, you know. Yeah, it um, wasn't a good year for ink, I guess, when they printed yeah, I know, <laughs> I can't even see the signatures on it, but, you know, but that, you know, I did that in 19. So I, I began doing, you know, a lot's work. And then, of course, I met some people who I'm still close and friends with today, mm -hmm. you know, um, who, you know, so it, it not only significantly changed how I did my work, but how I used myself to go back to mm -hmm. that use of self and people that I, I really you know, admired for how they use themselves. But I must say, I also had a love-hate relationship with Gestalt, you know. Um, mm. It was because, you know, Gestalt is practiced by people and people tend, <laughs> you know, to mess things up. And so in theory, it was, you know, it was here, but particularly around the diversity piece or managing mm -hmm. that piece, like they would put out exercises that they think were really good and then not know what to do with that, you know? So it's got like, okay, now what do we do within the room and then manage it poorly? Or, you know, it would be not based on theory, but just somebody's personal power agenda. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of crazy. And, you know, then, you know, you know, the people- would you, would you say that that was just sort of sad to witness, uncomfortable, like outright damaging, or was it sort of a challenge that then other things grew from? I think I, I jump on the word challenge. I think it was challenging because I always knew that the principles made sense mm -hmm. and if they were applied and that they had a human focus on it. So yes, but how people again, began to apply it or things that they would say that would just not make sense. Like around projection, I clearly remember one, one time when one of the professors said something about, um, you know, somebody's experience or even might've been mine, even of someone being an is, it was a racism or it just didn't feel good. And, you know, he started to explain it as a projection, you know, that, that person's reality was their reality, but I took it in and applied it to mine, which made that a projection. And therefore it really wasn't racism. It was my projection. <laughs> yeah, no, there, then there's uh, the field theory thing that says that. That's yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, so yeah. it just that, yeah, you know. That's, yeah, that is kind of damaging actually. It's not just challenging. Yeah. I think that's damaging. 
Yeah, and that and that was, I mean, I, I why well, I can still remember it years and years, you know, after, and I was just blown away by that. And yeah, I'm just imagining having the balls to tell someone that racism is a projection. I don't, I can't mm -hmm. imagine that. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the person had a lot of clout there, so it was like, yeah, you know, people were buying into it. It's kind of like now with these kind of alternative facts and this kind of like, you know, Mr. That didn't make any. That is not true. And since there weren't many people of color there, particularly blacks, <laughs> in the class, you know, that it looked like okay, you know, that, that people could buy into that. That was. Yeah, kind it's of, like all of the field is also ripe there for the microaggressions and the gaslighting and the. Mm -hmm. hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was not, you know, the, the, it's not that way anymore. More, I mean, there's, there's a, I've taught a, you know, a, a, a session on, a second, a workshop on um, becoming a better anti-racist, you know, mm -hmm. at, 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 in the of Cleveland, you know, recently and done some other work with the, with the faculty there. So, you know, I know that not to be true today, but it was clearly prevalent then you know and that's what i mean by people not taking the the principles and applying them in ways that were um that made sense you know? yeah yeah well i think it i mean it sort of comes back to the whole onion thing like there's also the layers of stuff that we already have that we haven't figured out or fixed right before we come to gestalt and exactly sometimes <laughs> those come through in those very flawed human ways which is mm -hmm. unfortunate. Exactly. I yeah. vividly recall at one time we were doing some practice sessions, you know, with the with the triad, and um, the person who was my um, I was supposed to be the client. They were the practice therapist, and he asked me what I was thinking about, and I told him, and then he asked me. He just said, "Well, I'm wondering more about your your experience of being black here." And I'm thinking, like, I'm talking about this mug. What are you talking about? You know, and then he said, well, I'm curious about that. And that must be ever present with you because of this. Uh, I'm trying to get it back to the mug, you know, and he kept going. And the, you know, the observer person was kind of like shocked, but they were like the same level we were saying thing. But the faculty person thought it was okay because it was kind of like the, I know they're explaining this other thing and wait a minute this it's, doesn't it, make it, yeah. sense it can't be the exception to the rule of the therapist exactly. not setting the figure right you know that was said you know we're because oh. that's what they were trying to they were trying to get a common figure here and that one stood out for them and this was I said oh no 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 I remember I was very very angry about that and took it to the program chair and I just said to him I was I can still remember being upstairs in that room just saying I have every right to come here and not have to and learn like everybody else and not have that dumped on me where I have to do that work plus you know the learning it's interrupting my learning you know um oh it was you know, so those are the kinds of things that when I say love hate relationship, I would say, you know, this theory is so good if y'all would just apply it. <laughs> you know, you just don't know what to do with it when it's not your, you know, your black, you know, your white liberal, you know, upper middle class person. You don't know what to do with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I, I agree with that very much. As, as a, speaking as a resident of Mexico. I agree with that. Oh, wow. I think that there's a lot of that. I don't know how to do this outside of a really comfortable, privileged white bubble. Yeah, exactly. Because you're never trained to do that. You probably never had to do that with your classmates who are in your privileged white bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree with that. And I, I am curious about your own work. Like, what have you done with Gestalt and the other resources? I mean, you've just retired, so maybe this is a great time to ask that. But I, I let's go for it. You know, what is what is your legacy? What is your your thing that you've created? Well, I you know, I'm I'm very proud of the application of Gestalt principles to racial identity development, you know, and what I uh, what I learned, you know, from um, the 
you know, just the work in terms of racial identity that's out there in the body of work in psychology, but really gave it, um, I think the stop principles has fattened it in ways that um, doesn't make it so um, dichotomous and, you know, this is white and this is people of color kind of thing. You know, this is human, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I've written about that and I use that in my, my work and my training and I like that. Then more recently, it's the, um, the principles that I've applied to being an, a better anti-racist, you know, because I've created the anti-racist style indicator, which is a tool to help people understand how to, how to dismantle um, race, systemic racism, you know, and how good they are at doing that, you know. And so I've applied many of the Gestalt principles, you know, um, the law of prognos, um, you know, um, what some of the other ones I do like like a workshop running, and then the whole uh, under functioning, over functioning from family therapy and, um, and systems therapy. Um, you know, it, it, it's embedded in there in terms of of how the tool got developed, how the questions got asked. You know, um, and it, it, I, you know, anybody who who has Gestalt background will know it. You know, and can <laughs> see it. But it's also, um, I, I like to translate um, those terms outside of, you know, Gestalt jargon, but make them mm -hmm. real. But it's heavily um, put into that. So that the anti-racist style indicator, the I, A, A, ASI, um, and then there's the racial identity self-assessment that goes with the racial identity um, development piece. Those are two um, tools that are out there actually for anyone to use their um, online assessment tools that are free and open access so people can use them, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to make that contribution and those were heavily rooted in gestalt and, and how, and how I use myself, you know, that I think the process that I use for workshops, you know, in terms of presenting, you know, and making sure, you know, there's the arc of the big, you know, beginning, middle, end, and the unit of work, and, um, you know, and all of those kinds, all that good stuff is, is all there. Mm -hmm. So on the other side of the love-hate, like those were some very evidently bad experiences that you talked about. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind as a highlight, one of those peak experiences, either as a trainee, client, therapist, clinician, presenter, what what pops up as one of those highlights for you? There, there, uh, there are a couple. One is on the individual level with some with a particularly difficult, really difficult client that, you know, there are just moments when you have a good session and it clicks with them and you can see, you can almost feel a movement in where they're going to go and how they're going to do that. And, and they could feel it. I could feel it. And it was, I felt like it was like one of the sessions. I could have, shoot, they should have taped me tonight. It was, this was perfect. You know, I was just like rolling. Could have been like one of those, you know, like those t training tapes, you know, where people, you're just really good in therapy and the, the tools were coming. The language was coming. It was spot on. I still remember that, you know, how, how it was in, and how it felt so good, you know, mm -hmm. that it just all came together on an indiv individual session. And then the other was the um, the keynote actually for the the conference that you convened. Oh, you know. I'm so glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Oh yeah, you know what? And it was it was because I also didn't expect to. You know, um, it was something because um, Jay was trying to get me to come to teach and to do some work in Toronto for a, a while. And I was at that point in, you know, different kind of busy than I am now, but more incredibly busy. And I was also invested just in writing about Gestalt, you know, because I applied it to my work in writing versus getting out there on any kind of speaking part or doing it in a 
um, direct fashion. You know, it was still influencing how I was using myself, but that. And so I, I cleverly tried to say no to her and, you know, all the different ways I could. And she kept coming back for, um, you know, <laughs> for, for more like, yeah, go over this with me. So when she asked about it, I said, I'm not quite sure what it was or why I said yes. I think it's because it was booked so far out, you know, um, that, you know, you can't kind of say like, well, in whatever is like a year and a half out, I'm booked on that date. You know, you could, I could have been, but you know, um, yeah, it, was, could be it was your birthday or something. But. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty far out. And so I even remember saying to my assistant, Holly, who's the same one today to say, oh, let me just do this and, you know, and, and get it over with, you know, but I'm only going to go in, fly in, fly out, you know, mm -hmm. in and out, you know, I'm not yeah. even going to stay for anything. And so then, then I thought there were going to be other barriers, like, you know, the price, the trip, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, every barrier got knocked out. So I, I came and, and then I still remember, you know, saying about, cause the theme was radical respect, you know? And when I had the conference call, so I said, you have to um, get me a conference call with um, the convenience because I want to understand what, what the, with this concept of radical respect is about. And I looked it up and I couldn't find much, especially from the Gestalt thing. I was like, what does this mean? And so, and then they said, well, like I said, in true good style fashion, we were hoping that you would unravel it. We thought that was a great theme for the conference. We thought that's what you would help us set. I'm thinking, really, really, damn, you know? So I, I kept noodling it for a while and then I would start to write or pieces would come. But I can tell you when I got there and when I was doing that cock, it was one of those things where I'm up there you can feel like this is my tribe. These are my people. These are the folks I can connect with. And it felt electric to me, you know. And I remember I did the um, the thing with the energy stick, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, I thought, you know, it's gonna stop. We're gonna have to do something experimental. But I also thought, oh, this, this if this flops, it's gonna be a big flop. And I don't know why I thought it was only gonna be like 50 people. Or people, and then there was like, I don't know how many people, it was like hundreds. 350. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, oh, damn. <laughs> Here we go. You know, and so trying to make that work on the spot, and people were so excited and they did it and they all, it all lit up. It was just wonderful. So it stands out because it was kind of a thrill and I was resisting, but then I didn't. But then since that time, I've written more about radical respect. I've woven it into the getting to we process. So um, that certainly stands out as a highlight. Wow. Well, that's that's kind of rewarding because yeah, like you said, you you did kind of give us every opportunity to let you off the hook. And <laughs> It was really important for us. I didn't know Jay had a history of trying to get you up there, but it became really important for the three of us to have you there. Yeah. And it was like, I'm, I'm glad that that worked out well. Well, I, so I, I was really glad myself. And then I, I was disappointed that I, you know, that I had to get back because, you know, it was, it was so good. And it was, it was, it was really, it was, it was such a good experience in terms of contact because I had told Jay I thought there was going to be a lot of resistance to the talk as well because generally what people I thought people would pick apart well that doesn't that's not really how confluence goes or that's not really how you know this you know I thought there was going to be a lot more academic kind of cerebral pulling it apart but people were like yeah that makes sense it's experience at all let's do this and I was like wow this is like really cool yeah, it kind of went south as the week wore on, but through no fault of yours. <laughs> but, yeah. So I, I am aware of your time, but I do want to ask before you go, um, what's next? What's next for you and what should be next for Gestalt from your perspective? You know, I think what's next for me, I know what's next for me is to do more work around racial equity and going deeper in that and turning us and them into we. And I rely on Gestalt a lot as, as a guide for that. Um, I'm initiating a, 
uh, another a couple projects around um, particularly white and black women in conversations about race and using Gestalt principles to how to make that happen. You know, um, so that's part of it. Forwarding more on the anti-racist style indicator and using that. So a lot of my work will is going to go deep into race equity, and um, excited about turning my um, book um, and the um, scenes from that book. Um, there's a, a, a theater um, company here in Cleveland, Caramu House, which is one of the oldest historically black, you know, um, theaters that's going to use the book to, you know, do create a play and theme. So I'm so very excited about that. You know, um, that, that now, so where Gestalt needs to go, I, I, I do think it's always so, um, and I'm going like this because it's, it's, it's so provincial, you know, um, in, you know, people, Gestalt principles being shared with other people who are Gestalt. So it's this little, you know, kind of too narrow of a club. And now with social media and with um, ways in which we can connect, you know, virtually around, I would hope that we would invite others in and have more of um, people experience the richness of Gestalt. I've always said that, you know, um, even around when I was, you know, um, on the editorial piece of um, Gestalt Review or where they would want me to write Gestalt Review, you know, even last from the last part and they can tell you I was saying, you know, I'll write this article, but I can tell you if it's only for subscription only, you know, I got more, you know, in my own network, you know, that I can send out with Count's Count is, is, you know, a couple thousand people compared to 200 people who can read this, you know. Actually read this, you know. yep. So it, it's it's got to be a wider influence or not even influence, just a wider audience for this great, great, this great body of, of work and, and thinking and applied and has so much to offer, particularly about where we are right now in our current state. I'm just gonna sit here and nod. I'm just gonna be nodding for like the next half hour. I agree with all of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add right now, either about yourself or a final thought? No, I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And, and Heather, I wanna say thank you for this work and, you know, and, um, and, and drawing me back to, you know, um, my roots in terms of Gestalt because you know, it is very grounding. And um, that's always a good thing in the in this sh shaky, wobbly world that we're in. You know, so mm. thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.